Welcome to Two Messianic Jews, and today we're going to do something a little bit different. We haven't done this yet, but we think it's a, kind of a cool opportunity. So a few days ago, we actually got a message on Facebook from uh, Joel Hoffman. He's a He wrote a blog at the Times of Israel. Uh, I think he's, uh, you said that he's a, a rabbi, Jonathan? Yep. He's an ordained rabbi. Ordained rabbi. Ordained rabbi. And he wrote an article for Times of Israel in 2018, but he sent it to us a few days ago, and it's entitled, Why Messianic Judaism is Fake. And so we told him that uh, we'd take a look at it, uh, and so we thought it'd be fun if we tried our hand at reading it live, reacting to it. We haven't read it yet. We've uh, tried, we've practiced our self-control for the last few days uh, in not reading it. Yeah. So you'll, you'll get our live first impressions of whatever he remarks on. So that's what we'll be doing here today. But before we get into reading the article, I thought it'd be interesting if we tried our hands at kind of quickly trying to predict what uh, Joel Hoffman uh, means when he says Messian Judaism is fake. What do you think, Jonathan? Yeah, that's cool. Let's do it. So I think what he mean, what he might mean, I think when it comes to the accusation that Messian Judaism is fake, it could mean any number of things, but... I'm going to predict that what he means by fake is that it's disingenuous, that either we're, we may be Jews of, uh, in, as far as descent and genealogy goes, but we're just acting Jewish, putting on Jewish clothes and using Jewish symbols in order to lure in non-believing Jews in order to uh, kind of secretly or uh, dishonestly persuade them to believe in Jesus and, in his mind, convert to Christianity. So that's going to be my prediction. What do you think, Jonathan? Yeah, I also agree that I don't think he's making a judgment on the truth of Messianic Judaism, like at least what I'm thinking going into this, but that is just that we're Christians in Jewish clothes who create churches with uh, talits, you know, and, and siddors and Torah scrolls, and we're just trying to lure Jews in to essentially convert them to Christianity. So in that way, it's fake. We're not being, we're not being up, up front with who we are and our intentions. And um, I, I, I get that. I, I mean, I've, I've experienced that myself. And um, when people don't know our community, uh, I don't, uh, I don't blame you. I don't blame people if they have that idea, because if we don't talk, then um, I, I can see how that could come about, especially with uh, the long history of, of different things that happened within uh we have a, we have videos on this, but yeah, so that's my prediction. Just uh, I agree with you, Eric. Just being uh, disingenuous about uh, w about being a Judaism, essentially. Gotcha. So you experienced this in the sense of like you've heard this accusation before. Is that what you mean? Yeah, yeah. Essentially, um, when if I if I walk into a synagogue, which I have, it's just oh, you're like Jews for Jesus. Like you're just a Jew for Jesus. You're just you're and and by that I mean that you're just a missionary trying to trying to get me to convert to Christianity. Um, yeah, and yeah. so you acting Jewish yeah. is just like a way to make Jesus more palatable type of situation. Right. Any any observance I've I've been experiences where um, I I've wore tzitzit and uh, an Orthodox Jew says why are you wearing that um, and I know this person and or I or he at least knows about me that I believe in Yeshua. And I told him numbers 15, which caught him off guard because that's, I'm just trying to fulfill the commandment like, like he would. Um, but I get it that there's, if he's, if he's had experiences, this person's had experiences that, um, they're just trying to get me to believe they're trying to get me to convert, which has actually happened in the news recently. Um, you see a lot of people, not a lot, but there's a good amount that has made the news of, of followers of, of Yeshua, Jesus, who are in Jewish communities representing themselves as Jews, but in fact, they're just Christians, and uh, which gives us a really bad name. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we may get more frustrated at those people than Orthodox Jewish people do. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, we'll, we'll make some videos addressing those situations. And if, if he does happen to be Orthodox, I guess what he means by fake, maybe he is, like, he potentially could be making just the truth claim of just saying Messian Judaism is fake because it's not true, and Orthodox yeah. Judaism is true. So that, that, that's another possibility. Mm -hmm. And if that is the claim that he makes, if he is Orthodox making that claim, it would be interesting to see if he's consistent with that 
and also says that therefore reform Judaism is fake Judaism or conservative is fake Judaism. I've seen some people, they are consistent and they do say that reform Judaism is just as fake as Messian Judaism in, in the truth claim sense. But then I've also seen people be inconsistent and try to keep all the other Judaisms except for Messianic. Mm -hmm. So we'll see what happens and uh, we'll see what uh, Joel Hoffman has to say. So let me pull up this article. All right, yep, there he is, Joel Hoffman, rabbi, teacher, columnist for Times of Israel. It's a it's a it's a blog, so it's like a, an opinion, an opinion piece. So, all right, so we'll just get, kind of go paragraph by paragraph, and I guess if we have uh, any thoughts on on the paragraph, uh, we'll we'll share them. So let's uh, see how this goes. Let's do it. All right. Why Messian Judaism is Fake The American Jewish community is enraged over Vice President Mike Pence appearing today, October 29th, this is in 2018, with a Messianic quote-unquote rabbi who offered up a prayer in Jesus' name in tribute to the 11 Jews who were murdered in Pittsburgh. All right, so I actually remember this taking place, and uh, I, I don't remember all of the details of it, but I do remember that this turned into like a media firestorm, essentially. And so I think I'll just keep on reading and see if he gives more details before I explain more. Sure. Unfortunately, many Jews today have fallen into believing in Jesus as the Messiah. Therefore, since the talk of Messianic Judaism is in the air, I have written this short informational piece for Jews who come across Messianic Jews on why Jesus cannot be the Messiah. Mm -hmm. In other words, a refutation of Christianity and Messianic Judaism in just 30 seconds. Okay. That's a pretty bold claim. Uh, that but, is. but yeah, so it, it seems like he's, he's, he's not trying to, at least at this point, say that Messianic Judaism is not Judaism. He's, he's actually here, he's distinguishing Christianity from Messianic Judaism. He says Christianity mm. and Messianic Judaism, he's trying to refute it in 30 seconds, which that would be impressive if he did. But, um, yeah, and I I get right here at least the, the first paragraph, the being enraged about this because I think here, it is a claim about, um, at least in this paragraph that Messianic Judaism is not Judaism, because why would you be enraged of of having a rabbi, um, you know, speak at at, at an event where we're, we're mourning the loss of eleven Jewish lives murdered in Pittsburgh, an anti-Semitic attack, um, that we should be I mean, grateful for you know, Mike Pence to have someone from the Jewish community come, but yeah, Messianic Jews are not considered by many within the wider Jewish community as members of the Jewish community. We're, we're, we're part of the church, we're Christianity. So as much as we consider ourselves as, as part of the Jewish community, um, there is this, uh, widespread attitude or, or conviction that we're not. And, you know, there's nothing we can do about that for him. It's not like, you know, we can, we can convince him right now, you know, that we are members of the Jewish community, which is how we view ourselves. Um, but I do understand that if you don't consider uh, the rabbi who spoke an actual rabbi ordained by a organization um, that he would consider uh, authoritative to ordain rabbis, then he would be upset. So, um, but yeah, so I think at the beginning, he's talking about how it's not Judaism, but I'm going to, instead of instead of arguing why it's not a Judaism, I'm going to argue that it's not true. So, but in the distinguishment between Christianity and, Judea and Messianic Judaism is also um, an interesting point that I'd like to see if he develops further. Yeah. Yeah, and I guess just to give a little bit more background on that uh, Mike Pence, I think, it was, I think it was just a Mike Pence rally, where, it, yeah, it came soon after the, the tragedy in, in Pittsburgh, and what got the Jewish community so riled up is that uh, Mike Pence was essentially having like an ecumenical prayer, like an interfaith prayer. So like a leader from many different religious communities come up and, and share a prayer for the Jewish community in Pittsburgh. So there was like a, a Christian pastor. I think there was a, a Catholic priest and, and probably like a, a Muslim imam. And the controversy was, is that the rabbi that he had to represent the Jewish community at which uh, the, this rally was being held was a messianic rabbi. And so as Jonathan was explaining, very often um, the 
wider Jewish community does not consider Messianic Jews as members of the Jewish community and definitely wouldn't consider a Messianic rabbi as a represent as a representative of the Jewish community. So so I think understandably, honestly, uh, that caused a lot of uh, outrage from the Jewish community. And personally, I, I do think uh, it would have been better and preferred if there was a, a rabbi outside of the Messianic camp, either from a, a conservative reform or, or local Orthodox uh, congregation to, to pray on behalf of the Jewish community. Yeah. But all that aside, we'll, we'll get into the, the next paragraph here. One, a foundation belief of Christianity and Messianic Judaism is the virgin birth. However, the word Alma in Isaiah 7-4 does not mean virgin, but means young woman. One can look this up in any dictionary of biblical Hebrew, nor is there anywhere else in the Hebrew Bible where the word Alma can possibly mean anything else. I think you can go on uh, just to get more of the, his argument. All right, let's see. Point two. Jesus did not meet the requirements for being the Messiah, such as being a descendant of King David on his father's side. He cites Genesis 49.10, Isaiah 11.1, Jeremiah 23.5, 33.17, Ezekiel 34.23-24, nor the requirement of being Torah observant, Deuteronomy 13.1-4, etc. The New Testament's accounts of Jesus clearly support this. Do you want me to just read the whole case here? Yeah, I do, actually. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll go that route. Number three. Jesus did not fulfill any of the prophecies of what the Messiah will do, such as building the third temple, Ezekiel 37, 26 through 28, ushering in world peace, Isaiah 2, 4, gathering all the Jews back to the land of Israel, Isaiah 43, 5 through 6, etc., beginning one's messianic reign, dying and coming back thousands of years later, was never a possibility of how the messianic era would unfold. Number four, and yeah, we're getting near the the end of our article here. The mention of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 as being a reference to Jesus is incorrect because the subject of Isaiah 52 and all of the prior chapters is clearly the Jewish people. Also, 11 times prior to Isaiah 53, the Jews are in fact referred to as a suffering servant. One needs to read the whole Tanakh, not just the excerpts. There are dozens of additional reasons why Jesus cannot be the Messiah and, consequence, and consequently the fallacy of Messianic Judaism. If a Jew who believes in Jesus is intellectually honest and a real seeker of truth, she or he will closely examine the above. Yeah. And that is the end of the article. Okay. Yeah. So it's I can I can already tell that it's, He's trying to refute it in 30 seconds, which um, unsuccessful just for the fact that uh, I'll, I'll give you one example right here. So he says that if you scroll down, he says that Jesus, let me just get the quote right, uh, the Torah observant point. So I guess scroll up a little bit uh, right there. Okay. So he says uh, a requirement for being the Messiah is that they must be Torah observant, citing Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4, and the New Testament's account of Jesus clearly support this. Uh, can I have some evidence? You know, I don't see any evidence cited there to say that Jesus uh, was not Torah observant. So just to give some background on this point, um, one of the key prayers in Judaism, uh, the hallmark, you know, you could say the watchword of Israel is the Shema, which is a commitment to obey the whole Torah, right? It's a commitment to the God of Israel alone and to obey the whole Torah. If you look at Mark 12, when Yeshua, when Jesus is asked, what is the greatest commandment? He said, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And then he coupled that by saying, And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And right there, he's not saying that loving God and one's neighbor replaces the commandments, and now you no longer need to be Torah observant. He's actually saying that this is how we are to read all the rest of the commandments. We are give our allegiance to God which already is understood as a commitment to obey the whole Torah. And then we read all of the other commandments through the lens of, will this be loving my neighbor or not loving my neighbor? So, and we see this throughout his debates. When you look at um, his debates with Pharisees, which was not a debate against Jews and Judaism. It was a debate with Jews within Judaism to give a, a paraphrase of Amy Jill Levine, who says, who talks about this herself. So, 
his he was committed to observe Shabbat. He was committed. He wore tzitzit. If you read in uh, Matthew chapter uh, nine, I believe, and in Matthew twenty three, you see that Jesus actually wore tzitzits, which, as I was talking about earlier, uh, Numbers fifteen, it was a commitment and a reminder to obey all the commandments. So. Uh, I don't think, I disagree with them that the New Testament clearly portrays and supports that Jesus was not Torah observant, but I do agree that if Jesus were to not be Torah observant or to teach that Jewish people should not keep the commandments or they no longer have to keep the commandments, then he's right. That would disqualify him as the Messiah, but I just disagree. The New Testament actually supports the view that Jesus was Torah observant. And if you actually read, actually read, I'm not, I don't want to make any claims against, um, Rabbi, Rabbi Hoffman, that he's not reading this, but um, most scholars would disagree with, with, with Rabbi Hoffman, saying that Jesus actually should be placed within Judaism. He fits within Second Temple Judaism, and he was a Torah-observant Jew. So scholarship is in support of this, but not just a site scholarship. The, the New Testament clearly portrays uh, Jesus as one who is committed to the Torah, a rabbi himself, gathering disciples and teaching them how best to follow the commandments. Yeah. Yeah. In my experience reading the New Testament scholarship about, uh, about Jesus is that it's, it seems to nearly be unanimous nowadays that he was a Torah observant Jew throughout his life, embedded in the Jewish community and and lived, uh, as Jewish of a lifestyle as, as one could have back in the day. And in fact, kind of New Testament scholarship has, moved so far so far past that like that's such an assumption now the now new testament scholarship is now turning their attention to paul and there's even a a growing minority within pauline scholarship arguing that paul remained torah observant throughout his life and expected uh, other jewish people uh, even those who are followers of uh, of jesus to to do the same and so not only is like it's such an assumption now for Jesus that New Testament scholarship has turned its attention to Paul, which is kind of the the most stereotypical non Torah observant Jewish person uh, anybody may think of. But as we see and as we talk about a lot on the channel, in New Testament scholarship, there's a very strong case being made that even Paul himself was a Torah observant Jew. So um, yeah, again, we don't know how much uh, Rabbi Hoffman has has been able to read, and if that. That does seem to be uh, what he is claiming here, that Jesus was not Torah observant as presented in the New Testament. But yeah, if you read the New Testament closely, and especially if you read it alongside modern scholarship, um, the exact opposite is shown. Yeah. Okay. Jonathan, I want to I wanna ask you just kind of a, approaching all of this stuff in general, because essentially it seems like he's he's mentioning a lot of Messianic criteria, that is kind of the the going notion of, of what the Messiah uh, is supposed to accomplish uh, within uh, the religious Jewish community. And I'm just curious, how, how do you go about approaching that just kind of in general, like when mm-hmm. it comes to these claims that Jesus did not fulfill these requirements and criteria that Judaism uh, lists and expects the Messiah to do? Right, right. So it's true that Jesus did not fulfill most of the, the the major things that are supposed to happen within the messianic age right there's not world peace the the temple is not rebuilt all the exiles have not returned right i'm still i'm still living here in the united states right i'm not we're not returned um there's secular jews all over the world so not all of israel not all the jewish people are following the torah so there's 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 plenty of messianic prophecies that have not come to fruition and yeshua jesus died before any of these things happened. They haven't happened yet. So why do I think that Yeshua is the Messiah, even though he didn't fulfill these, these different criteria of what the Messiah is supposed to do? So the way I go about it is that Yeshua made a claim. Okay. He claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed that he would demonstrate his Messiahship through his death and resurrection. If you read this in Matthew chapter 12, read read the chapter, go to verse 38 through 40, and you'll see that when Yeshua, when the crowds thought that th- because of his healing ministry, because he healed a, uh, a demoniac, a man who was blind and mute, the crowds say, can this be the Messiah? They, what they actually say is, can this be the son of David, meaning the Messiah? And the Pharisees say, uh, give, us, give us a sign to show us what you're saying is true, right? And they debate and they debate. And well, 
going back in Matthew 12, they say, um, he, the way he cast out demons is through Beelzebul, the ruler of demons. And they have this debate of whether the source of Jesus' power is Beelzebub or is it from God. And then it comes down that says, uh, some of the Pharisees say, give us a sign. And he said, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so will the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So what he was saying there is that the way you're going to know that I am the Messiah, the way the sign I'm going to provide you is my death and resurrection. And this is, this is interesting because when we read the Torah, we see that God validates true prophets through miracles. This is the way we know whether a prophet is from God. And Deuteronomy 13 is actually a great text to to show this because it says that false prophets, if someone claims to be a prophet and they provide a miracle, they've brought a sign or a wonder, the sign or wonder comes true, but they say, follow another God you haven't known, or they say, stop keeping Torah. Don't listen to them. In fact, put, uh, you're supposed to kill them, right? The, they're supposed to be put to death. The only reason a false prophet would provide a sign or wonder, a miracle is if that is how Israel is supposed to recognize whether a prophet is a true prophet. So the what what I actually found is that the Maimonides, so the great Jewish philosopher Maimonides, who in Orthodox Judaism he's highly regarded, and in the Jewish community in general, and I, I highly regard him, disagree with some of what he says, but when it comes to how you identify a true prophet, Maimonides tells us that the way that you know whether a prophet is a true prophet is by identifying the source of power for their sign or their wonder, their miracle. So if the sign comes from God's power, then that means the sign validates a true prophet. If the sign derives from sorcery, then the sign does not validate the prophet. Maimonides tells us that the way you know is by judging their teaching. So if they teach against Torah, then you know whatever they did was done by secret arts with the aid of witchcraft. That's a quote from Maimonides. And so what's interesting is that the resurrection is unique because the resurrection is something that only God can do. Only God raises the dead. We see this in, in texts like uh, 2 Samuel 2 verse 6 and uh, I believe Deuteronomy 32 verse 39. And even in the Jerusalem Talmud in Sanhedrin 10 2, it says that only the Holy One of Israel, only God raises the dead. So what I what I see from this is that if Yeshua claimed that his messianic sign would be validated through his resurrection, only God raised the dead, then what this means is that Yeshua's re- um, identity, his messianic identity was validated by his resurrection from the dead. And we also know, well, it could be said that, okay, well, maybe Maybe God is is testing Israel because in Deuteronomy 13, it says that the reason these false prophets do these miracles is because God is testing you. But it wouldn't make any sense for God to empower the prophet who's doing the miracle because when you read things like Deuteronomy 18, it says the way you know if someone's a true prophet is if, if, their, if, is if their prophecy comes about. So because God would not fulfill the prophecy of a false prophet, God would not validate the claims of a false prophet. You see, so what I do there is when it comes to messianic prophecy, I th- the way I view this is this. I see Matthew gives all these fulfillment citations. You know, he says that if you go up into the screen, it says, you know, he's arguing that the Hebrew word Alma means young woman, not virgin. Or he says that, you know, Jesus was not a descendant of David. He's disagreeing with, um, with Luke or Matthew's genealogy of Joseph being the biological father saying that like he can't be because, you know, he's a a virgin. He's no longer the father. There's adoption doesn't work, all those things. So the way I see this is that the New Testament explains what explains Jesus, how he fulfills the scriptures as the Messiah, but the resurrection is the evidence that he is the Messiah. So the resurrection is the indication that Yeshua is, is the Messiah and that he taught Israel to remain faithfully committed to keeping the Torah, to keeping the commandments. So I read, I understand Yeshua as the Messiah because of his resurrection. So all of these, all of these um, objections that he brings up saying that, you know, the temple is not rebuilt and you know, this doesn't, doesn't work because Isaiah 53 is talking about Israel. It's not talking about Jesus. I'm like, okay, well, for the sake of argument, I'm I'm not even uh, sure exactly. I mean, I'm there's I think there's good arguments to say that that the suffering servant is Israel. There's good arguments. There's also good arguments that it's Messiah. Okay, let's table that and say the 
Isaiah 53 could be referring to Israel. It's referred the ser- the servant is Israel in the in the con- in the chapters in context, right? But I can understand that as also referring to the Messiah who is Yeshua, who is the representative of Israel. So I understand these mess these prophecies that the New Testament uh, cites as evidence for so I understand these prophecies that the New Testament references that Yeshua fulfilled because I understand Yeshua as the Messiah because he rose from the dead. You see how it all comes through? It all is through the lens of the resurrection. Yeshua's resurrection is the indication that he's the Messiah and the indication that he taught Israel to to remain faithfully committed to keeping the commandments. Yeah, so at least for for me and you and and hopefully more people as they uh, watch your videos that goes over this more, uh, our case for trusting in, in Yeshua and Jesus as the Messiah and trusting that uh, Yeshua is who God has identified as the Messiah isn't reliant on Isaiah 53. Right. Uh, it's not even reliant on uh, Jesus fulfilling every single one of these requirements that maybe for a lot of Jewish history, many Jews kind of set that expectation for themselves. But due to the evidence for the resurrection and all of the implications that it has via the lens of Deuteronomy 13, and a uh, helpful support from Maimonides, like that's what we're relying on here. Mm-hmm. And so at the end of the day, this, you know, kind of going after kind of prophecy by prophecy and trying to poke holes in it uh, while avoiding the issue of the resurrection, it it has no effect, at least on, on me and you, right. right? Right, and I would also add that what the resurrection also does is it indicates, it's it's God's way of telling us that Yeshua is the one who will fulfill these messianic prophecies when he returns. So there's not world peace. The resurrection is the indication that Yeshua is the one who will bring peace. The temple's not rebuilt. If we interpret these texts that he's citing here in Ezekiel 37 as, yes, the temple's supposed to be rebuilt, Yeshua is the one who fulfilled that. All, all these things, right? All these, all these prophecies are going to be fulfilled, and the confidence that I have in these prophecies, which, again, an Orthodox Jew would also agree with, like, I have I have excellent, I have great confidence and faith that these will be fulfilled because I know who the guy is going to fulfill them. And the way I know who the guy is going to fulfill them, that who the Messiah is, is because I know that Yeshua rose from the dead. Yeah, and, and we see that this is, this method of demonstrating who a prophet is via signs and then expecting... Uh, the people of Israel to respond to that sign and, and trust the prophet who's being identified is there's meant much precedent for that uh, throughout scripture. Uh, I don't, did you go over this already earlier, Jonathan? You mentioned uh, Moses proved himself right. as prophet. So I, I, did, um, I didn't give examples, but yeah, um, if, if, if you're talking, you can go. No, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah sure. Sh- share. Sure. So when there's, there's examples in this. So if you look at Exodus 14 verse 31, Exodus 1431, it's describing how Israel, the Jewish people, just crossed through the Red Sea. The, the, the Egyptian army is coming after them. And then the when when Moses uh, raises his staff, right, the the waters come and collapse on the Egyptian army. Then Israel is looking back on the Egyptians being being taken in after they have just been enslaved for hundreds of years, and God has delivered them. And they say, and this is what and this is what they say. Um, they believe God. Actually, if, if you could just let me pull up my Bible just to bring it out, just to give the exact quote. Um, yeah, sure. And even um, even before Exodus 14, we see uh, Moses appearing before Pharaoh and, and I think before the, the people as well, at least before Aaron. And he's, you know, he's pulling out his staff and it's turning into a serpent or he's putting his hand uh, in his in his clothes and takes it out and it's leprous and then he puts it back and it's healed. It's like he's doing these signs in order to uh, persuade Israel and and Pharaoh that God has uh, identified Moses as somebody for Israel to follow and for Pharaoh to to listen to. Uh, right. But yeah, Exodus 14 is a particularly interesting example. When you read Exodus 14, verse 31, this is what happens when Israel... Res- this is Israel's response, and it says... When Israel saw the wondrous power which the Lord had wielded against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord, they had faith in the Lord and his servant Moses. So 
the reason that Israel had faith that Moses was a true prophet, the reason they had faith in Moses and they had faith in God was because they saw how God had validated him through these miraculous signs. And they saw this not just with the Red Sea parting and the Red Sea coming down. They saw this through the plagues in Egypt. They saw this when Moses and Aaron showed them these signs. When you look at Joshua, the the, the prophet who came after Moses, when he the miracle that he does is they crosses through the Jordan with the heap coming up, right? When they cross the Jordan and the, and the heap of water come up. And this is what it says in, in Joshua three, sorry, Joshua four, verse 14. After they are, after, uh, Israel crosses through the Jordan, it says on that day, the Lord, on that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel. So they revered him all his days as they had revered Moses. So the reason that the reason that Israel has faith that Joshua was a true prophet, the reason Israel had faith that Moses was a true prophet, was because they saw how God had validated him through these miracles. It's the miracles that demonstrate their prophetic status. So it's we see this precedent already already in the Torah. So like when I say I agree with Maimonides, the reason I agree with him is because I think he's interpreting the Torah correctly. Mm. Yeah, and and like the examples that you're pulling from with with Moses and and with Joshua. It was those signs that convinced Israel that Moses will bring them out of Egypt and and yeah. Joshua will bring them into the promised land. Right. They didn't see these these signs and these wonders and go, oh, these people aren't prophets yet because they haven't already brought us into the promised land. That's like right. their the criteria, the requirement hasn't been fulfilled. These aren't the the promised people, or these aren't the people that we should be following. When in reality when you just kind of think logically, it has to ha- happen the other way around. It's like in order to get to the destination, you have to trust the the guide whom God has identified. And that's exactly what they did uh, in response to Moses and, and to Joshua. Yeah. And so we just view that same line of logic uh, with, uh, with Yeshua, with Jesus. So God has identified him as the Messiah through the resurrection, a miracle that only God can do. So we can have a lot of confidence in that. And that, Yeshua, that Jesus is the one who will do these requirements that haven't yet been fulfilled. And in addition to those things, he will be the one uh, reigning in the kingdom of God and in the heavenly temple, acting as uh, the high priest. He is reigning and acting as the high priest in the temple, in the heavenly temple right now, as we read uh, in, in Hebrews. But all that aside, it's that kind of line of logic. God has identified the prophet whom Israel and with the Messiah, the whole world is expected to follow because he is the one who will bring us to the kingdom of God, to salvation, uh, to eternal life, and all that kind of stuff. So we just see it. This is just a parallel line of logic that we see with Moses and uh, with Joshua. To, to add to that, it's really cool because so we see these messianic prophecies that, that uh, Rabbi Hoffman is describing that are in Isaiah and in Ezekiel. And right, Isaiah is writing like 700 years before the time of Yeshua. And it's even, it's, it's way, it's thousands, right? It's like 2,000, 2,700 years, right? Or, or around there when it comes to how far he is from us. So it's cool because these prophecies about what's going to happen in the Messianic age, about the Messiah, you know, if you read Ezekiel uh, 37, there's, a, there's actually a really great description of the Messiah reigning as, as king who has, who's, who's in the temple. It's all these things. There's peace, right? Well, God is telling us kind of at the, you could say like the halfway point, or maybe it's a lot further down the road, but instead of waiting until the Messiah comes, he's kind of giving us, okay, just let you know, this is the guy who's going to do it. And then through the resurrection, the, the nations, like there's, there wasn't Christians this whole time. Like we think that, you know, there's, there's monotheism today, right? Well, because of the resurrection, monotheism, the belief that they're, that the God of Israel is the true God, the creator God spread through the nations. The pagans who were uh, these Gentile, these pagans gave up their paganism. Many of them did and started worshiping uh, the God of Israel. They started worshiping the God Jews were worshiping. So, right. You know, there's these prophecies that, uh, you know, in the end of time that, you know, they, uh, the Gentiles will grab a tzitzit of the Jew and say, you know, let us go with you. Well, we're kind of seeing that already happening. So it's kind of like paving the way for the Messiah to come. I mean, more could be said on this. Um, a great, a great book. And you're, if you're, if you're watching this and you're like, well, you know, how do you, how do you know that Jesus rose from the dead or this idea of, of the Messiah bring, 
uh, making way for the nations to worship the God of Israel. These kind of ideas. I'd recommend uh, Pincus Lapide. He has a book called, uh, let's see, what's on the shelf, but it's called uh, The Resurrection of Jesus, uh, A Jewish Perspective by an Orthodox Jewish scholar and rabbi, uh, Dr. Pincus Lapide, who, um, great, great book, but it's interesting because I really wish I could have shared um, this kind of way of looking at it with him. Uh, but the late Dr. Lapide, I, th- I would be very curious how, how he would have responded to this argument. But if you're watching this, if you're listening to podcasts and you have, and you're like, have questions or objections or thinking about like how to better understand this or clarify the points, just uh, comment below. But that's essentially why Eric and I um, find this, these objections at Jesus can't be the Messiah because he fails to fulfill these messianic criteria. The only criterion on that list that would actually disqualify him is if he was uh, taught against Torah, Deuteronomy 13. And when you read the New Testament in its Jewish context, then you actually see that uh, Jesus was faithful to Judaism. In Matthew 5, 17, you actually read that he says, I have not come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And when you know what that means in its Jewish context, I have a video on this. What he's basically saying is I have not come to stop Jews from keeping the Torah. I have not come to stop Jews. I'm not, I've not come to get Jews to abandon Judaism because that was the big concern with the, with what we see in the Maccabean literature. And Yeshua is saying right there, I'm not, I'm not like that. I'm not like these apostate Jews. I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to let Jews commit themselves to the Torah. I'm going to show you how best to follow the Torah. I'm the Messiah. I'm the one who's come. I'm the one who's going to come back. I'm the one who's going to be reigning as King over Israel. So, um, yeah, I, to say that he's refuting Christianity and Messianic Judaism in 30 seconds. Uh, I, I, yeah, obviously, you know, we don't think he has. <laughs> yeah. And, and before wrapping this up, uh, I just want to make sure people catch that. Uh, but when it comes to Dr. Pincus Lapid, uh, he was a lifelong Orthodox Jew who actually concluded from a historical case, from a historical perspective, that Jesus did in fact rise from the dead. And so getting that book is definitely highly recommended. And when it comes to uh, Jesus and what he taught and how he lived according to Torah, check out Jonathan's video, Did Jesus Replace Judaism? That's an awesome, uh, more in-depth look at that question. And so... Joel Hoffman, we appreciate uh, your engagement with uh, our our faith and caring enough to to explain to us and others to care about truth enough to to share your opinion and to put it out there uh, to to be uh, looked at and and criticized and and considered and hopefully anybody who's listening or watching hopefully we provided some some value and and some interesting thoughts on what Joel Hoffman uh, wrote here. If you want to see us do more content like this uh, in the future, then let us know in the comments. Like the video, subscribe to the YouTube channel and to the podcast. And you could also send us an email at two messianic jews at gmail.com. That's T W O messianic jews at gmail.com if you want to share some thoughts with us there. Thank you for joining us and see you next time. <laughs>